how did Ginkgo Bioworks transition from having approximately, or I think as they had mentioned, like even a few years ago, more than 1.3 billion on their sheets in the bank to a little less than barely 800 million now. And I think that this is a very important type of discussion or types of thoughts that we can have for any type of company because all these companies are now saying that, oh, you know, they're laying off people and they're streamlining operations and getting maybe rid of some people who have been there for a long time in core departments to slow down their cash burn. But even if they're slowing down the cash burn, in the case of Ginkgo Bioworks, in my opinion, from the types of things that they've been doing and how they've been trying to mention how they're trying to conserve capital to put themselves in a strategic position so that they can at least be around for the next couple of years, even though they're they're at the very beginning of enacting their their uh, reductions in the workforce for at least 25%, and I'm sure very soon we're going to hear the exact percentage, but even when they're reducing their cash burn over the past couple of years they've been giving out still a lot of stock options and there's probably even been as a lot of people i mentioned from yahoo finance and other types of sources a lot of types of insider trade and insider activity even from their operations um their operations uh person there who sold um one like around 1.6 million or if not more of the stock and as well as uh, the Mark guy, uh, the chief financial officer, he's been selling things like a long time. And, you know, so I just think that that goes to show that even if a company is still trying to reduce its cash burn and try to get rid of people that it thinks it could do without of in terms of still being able to operate as nimbly as possible, as they say, I think that that reduction in workforce and that type of reputation, which is going to be around Jason Kelly and Ginkgo Bioworks in general, it could maybe make some people less, uh, you know, uh, less, you know, you know, less adamant or, you know, exercise, you know, less initiative to actually meet all of the demands for the jobs because, you know, all their jobs are in person. They all have PhD, they, uh, you know, all their jobs require PhDs, even though a lot of the jobs that even I've looked at, like for myself or other positions, because other related positions, because I'm curious, a lot of them can be done with someone if they have, a, if he or she has a lot of experience with a master's. But the thing is that Ginkgo, they just want to have this as a type of selling point because it's really funny that uh, Jason, every time someone mentions something about either the Securities and Exchange Commission doing some type of investigation into their business and how they generate revenue from their business and how their foundry could actually be useful for scaling up synthetic biology he always seems to brush it off but this type of accusation or claim or allegation in one form or another it's come up against them for years and uh it's kind of odd to me that they keep he keeps trying to brush it off and for sure if the sec or the other people you know, and related organizations related to the financial industry, they contact you or a CEO or a higher ranking executive in a company. And they're trying to ask about ways in which you do your business and more transparency on the companies, because there are a lot of companies actually like that Ginkgo Bioworks has listed on its sides for its quarterly reports that it does directly fund and that it has made an investment in. So it's like, we thought the whole time that the application of this foundry business was to be able to attract people from you know many other biotechnology companies that ginkgo doesn't have any type of direct stake in or direct financial you know investment or obligation in. and um i think that still that is true at least for its pharmaceutical giants because these are very large pharmaceutical companies that were around before even ginkgo bioworks was formed and they have formed they had developed through their through their discovery, through their um, compound discovery and drug discovery pipelines, several other types of compounds that have already been on the market and have already helped people and patients. But the thing is that um, for some of the other cases, we can see that if it's more of an outlier case, maybe in another area of the biotechnology industry, but not necessarily having to do with the pharmaceuticals or the development of you know novel compounds and uh, you know uh, interactions between like proteins and ligands or other types of biological systems uh, then it would kind of not look good and not provide a very strong case for the foundry model in the business in general because why um, it's kind of like they're pushing someone almost 
to their to the footsteps of their foundry to make use of their foundry instead of just continuing to uh, have no financial obligation and not actually put any money in this company just to receive some money back because it's no point because there has to be some asymmetry in their interaction between the the client that ginkgo is looking at and the foundry that them as the maintainers of the foundry that they're using so i think that a lot of that stuff like it really confuses me when i saw it and i think obviously it's confused people for years because i'm not the only person there are so many um forums and the like which discuss this type of things but i think that just also demonstrates that look they've burned like 500 like half a billion in cash and they try to say in there's they're in a strategic position when really if you ask me even though they've added more programs into their cell engineering portion of the foundry it's not resulting in better financial performance they lost like half of their revenue and i know that a lot of tech companies are kind of in this type of position now but um, I just think that it's different in the case uh, for some area, some companies in the biotechnology sector, especially because those executives they kind of overinflated what they could make use of and how they could apply different, whether it be different types of algorithms or different types of uh, experiments and increasing the throughput of these experiments, which they felt would maybe lead to a novel discovery of some compound that would either, that could be taken to market in a fast enough time frame, but I don't think that that's still panning out. And um, if people just, you know, or if executives continue to talk about how they'll do something for years and it never materializes, it's like, you know, maybe they could have identified some of these types of difficulties with their foundry business model when they were founded in 2008. And then maybe they could have anticipated some types of difficulties rather than saying almost 15 years later that they would enact some types of changes to the, to the, to the terms in, um, to the terms of their, of their foundry. So I think that still, it can be like a good place to do synthetic biology, but, um, rather than maybe the pharmaceutical era, which they're trying to expand in, or potentially the biosecurity in which like they had described, and I'm sure they're going to describe more in upcoming events, how they um, how they can like increase the throughput, you know, of um, screening and perform screenings for airports and, and other foreign governments. Like, I don't really think that um, that's maybe the strongest case of how applicable or how agile their foundry model is even though it's still of course it still demonstrates some potential revenue and uh some some potential application of their model